Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking your precious time out just to listen to His Word today. May God's richest blessing, peace and love be with you all. Today, we are going to look at the first part of Ephesians chapter 4. And our text is from verse 1 right down to verse 6. It says here, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we can come to your word today. May you bless us through your word. And I pray as I teach this morning that you will anoint me and all the hearers. In Jesus' mighty and glorious name we pray. All God's people say, Amen and Amen. Today, my topic is Walk Worthy of Our Calling. Walk Worthy of of our calling. Paul had just finished teaching the first three chapters of Ephesians on doctrine. And that is from chapter 1 to chapter 3. And now from chapter 4 to chapter 6, he wanted to exhort his readers to put all that they have heard into practice. He said, at chapter 1 to chapter 3, since God has blessed us so much, now live out that life as Christian, so that when people look at you, they will see Christ in you, that you walk in a manner worthy of the high calling with which you have been called. So basically, I have three points here, and I'm going to start with the first point, which is, number one, the exhortation to a worthy walk. The exhortation to a worthy walk. That's verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Notice how Paul began this section. He began this section by mentioning himself, number one, as a prisoner. Look at verse one. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Can you remember he was using these same words to describe himself right in chapter three, verse one. Now the question is why? Why he had to say that? Why he had to mention his imprisonment to his readers again right here? The reason he did that is because he wanted to highlight to his readers that to walk a worthy walk sometimes can be very costly. Very costly. Now just look at Paul's life as an example. Because of his desire to walk worthily before God, what happened? It caused him what? Much pain and suffering. Am I right? Even to the extent of being thrown right into the prison cells. The same goal with Jesus Christ. He paid a considerable amount of price 
for his obedience to his father. Isn't that true? And this is what Paul told Timothy, the young preacher, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He said, Yes, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. Look at the word. Will suffer persecution. You see, there's a price to pay for a worthy walk with which we have been called. This was what we see in the life of Paul and also in the life of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Paul understood that completely. He knew the high cost that was associated with the gospel. I hope you do as well. Not only he exalted his reader to a worthy walk as a prisoner, then number two, he continued on to exhort his reader as a pleader. As a pleader. That's number two. After he introduced himself as a prisoner, now he's pleading with his reader. He said at verse one, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you or implore you. He was pleading with them and begging them to live in such a way and walk in such a manner that is worthy of their calling. Look at how Paul began at verse 1. He began with the word therefore. Can you see that? Therefore. And by using the word therefore, he was referring to what he had said before. That is in chapter 1 to chapter 3. He told them right at chapter 1 verse 1, that they were saints. Then at chapter 1 verse 3, that they have been blessed with all spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Then at chapter 1 verse 4, he told them that they have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Then in chapter 1 verse 5, he told them they have been adopted as sons. In chapter 1 verse 7, he told them that they have been redeemed and receive the forgiveness of sins. Then in chapter 1, verse 11, he told them that they have been given an inheritance in heaven. Then in chapter 1, verse 13, he told them they have been sealed with his Holy Spirit. Then in chapter 2, verse 4, and verse 5, he told them that they have been made alive in him. Then in chapter 2, verse 13, he said they have been brought night. Because of who? Because of the blood of Christ. And therefore now he said to them, because of all that, that has happened, now live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In other words, live like you are a child of God. Live like you have been safe. Now go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. Look at what Paul said here. He said, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as who? As the rest of the Gentiles walk. That means don't live like the people of the world anymore who walk in the futility of their minds. In other words, you got to live different now. You cannot live like you used to. Your lifestyle, your mannerism got to change. Your conduct got to change. Your usage of words got to be different now. Now read Romans 13 verse 13. It says, let us walk properly. That means behave properly as in the day, not in reverie. That means not in noisy and wild party and drunkenness and in lewdness. That means behave in a very offensive way and last, not in strife and envy. In other words, he was telling them, order your conduct 
and lifestyle properly in this world. No more behaving like the people of the world. Behave like Christian. Can I hear me? Amen. So my first point, the exaltation to a worthy walk. Now, secondly, let us look at the elements, the elements for a worthy walk. Look at verse 2. Paul says here, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now here, Paul gave us four elements as to how you and I can walk a worthy walk before God and before men. Now you may say, what are those four things? Number one, Number one is called loneliness. Loneliness. That's humility. Look at what Paul says at verse 2. He said, with not just loneliness, with all loneliness. In other words, Paul wants each one of us to be very humble. That's how Christians should behave in this world. We should not be proud. We should be lowly. We should be humble. Do you know why there's so much problems in churches today? It is because men and women who don't know their place and they fight for their so-called rights in the church. You see, pride is the number one cause of problems in the church. Yes, because pride will cause many not able to submit to one another. But whenever there's humility, whenever there's lowliness in our life, there'll be less strife, less fights in the church. Are you also aware that even non-Christian will be put off whenever they see Christians that are proud? Yes, not only the non-Christian, even God as well. Do you know God cannot tolerate pride in each one of our lives? Whenever God sees pride in us, the Bible says He will come against us. That's what James 4, 6 says. God resists. The word resist means He opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You see, pride is something which God couldn't tolerate, and stand. Why God hates pride so much? Because pride is always associated with the devil. It resembles him. That's what caused God to resist the devil and to oppose him and to reject him and to cast him out of heaven. It is because of what? It is because of his pride. So when you and I have pride, we will look like the devil. Did you hear that? Yes, we will look like the devil whenever we had pride in our lives. And when God sees us behaving like the devil, what will he do? He will show sure oppose us. Am I right? He will show sure resist us the same way he had resisted the devil. So what is the first element we all must have in this world, in the church? Number one is called lowliness. The second element which we must all have is called gentleness. This is one quality which people love. People love gentle people, isn't that so? They want people to be nice to them, to be gentle to them, to be gentle in their words, in their approach, in their mannerism. Am I right? Nobody like people that are rude to them or harsh to them. It put people off. Now what the Lord said in Matthew eleven twenty nine: 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. Can you see that? For I am gentle 
and lowly. You see our Lord. He's a gentle Lord and lowly Savior. And you will find rest for your soul. Look at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. He says, let your gentleness, let what? Your gentleness be known to all men. Then he said, the Lord is at hand. Now, why he said gentleness, let it be known to all men. Then all of a sudden he said, the Lord is at hand. Why he said that? It is because when our Lord returns back to this earth, He wants to see gentleness in each one of us. So what is the first element which we all must have? Number one, lowliness. Number two, gentleness. Then number three, the third element which we must have that feed our high calling is called long-suffering. Long suffering. It means to be able to suffer long. In short, it means patient. Patient. This is something which we must all have, which we must cultivate in order to walk worthy before men and before God. Do you know, lack of patience is what made most Christians lose lose their testimony, be it at home, be it at work, or in church. So we have learned three elements that we all must have to feed our high calling. Number one, lowliness. Number two, gentleness. Number three, long-suffering. Then fourthly, the fourth element that Paul says we all must have is called love. This is a must for all Christians. This is how the world look at Christian today. Christian should be one that is full of love. Can I hear me? Amen. And this is what our Lord said in John 13, verse 34 and verse 35. He says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I love you. So you must love one another by this, by what? By love. All will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Bearing, bearing with one another. In what? In love. So these are the four elements or the four signs that will indicate that we are Christian. Number one is called what? Loneliness or humility. Number two, gentleness. Number three, long suffering. Then number four, love. Ask yourself, are you humble? That's what Christian should be. Number two, are you gentle? Can people see your gentleness. Are you long-suffering? Do you have patience? Are you forbearing each other in love? Can you love people? Can you show love even to those that are unkind to you or rude to you? So these are the four things Paul is pleading with his readers and hearers to have. So I've touched on number one, the exaltation to a worthy walk. Number two, the elements for the worthy walk. Then my last point, which is the evidence. The evidence of a worthy walk. Verse 3 to verse 6. You ask, what is the evidence of a worthy walk? It is unity. That's the evidence of a worthy walk. That's what God wants to see in the life of each believer. That's what the world also wants to see as well. Now think, how can the world see Christ in us if believers who claim themselves to be God's children, but they are always fighting with each other and they can't work together 
and they can't live together before the unsafe world. So if they keep on seeing us talking bad about each other, talking bad about our church, talking bad about our God, how can they see God in us? It is impossible. Am I right? This is why Paul, firstly, he gave us what? The mandate for unity. Look at verse 3. The mandate for unity. He said at verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity. That means making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Now, why the word spirit appears here? It is because without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can never achieve unity through our own strength. Then he said, in the bond of what? In the bond of peace. Why peace? It means dealing everything in a peaceful manner, in a peace-loving way. So keeping the unity of the church is the responsibility of every believer. So we have looked at the mandate for unity. Now look secondly at the model, the model of unity, verse 4 to verse 6. Paul used the example of the Holy Trinity from verses 4 to 6. At verse 4, he mentioned the person of the Holy Spirit. At verse 5, he mentioned the person of Christ. At verse 6, he mentioned God being the Father of all. So the three persons of the Godhead each has functions and has a part to play to bring about the unity in the church. By using the word one seven times, O-N-E, one, seven times, in these three verses, from verses 4 to verses 6, indicate for us that's the desire of God for His church. It is the oneness in God and in the church that God is seeking after. He mentioned here, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all. So by giving us the example of oneness right here, Paul set forth for us the example which every believer on earth should aspire and desire to have. So let us look firstly at the unity brought by the Spirit. Verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, just as you've been called in one hope of your calling. Without hesitation, Paul showed us that there's only one body. That one body here refers to the body of Christ. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is responsible to put you and I into that body of Christ, the moment we confess and receive Christ as our own personal Savior and Lord. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized. Means immerse. Immerse into what? Into the one body. This is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about baptism into the body of Christ. It doesn't matter whether you are Jews or Greek, slaves or free. All have been made to drink of that one spirit. Now look at the word. It says here, drink. It refers to every believer that after we've been saved, we've been called upon to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. As what Jesus said in John 7, verse 37 to verse 39. If you thirst, come and drink. That's what Jesus said. And look at the word, all. We are all made, all made to drink into the one spirit. It means, the word all here, it means everyone is called upon to be baptized and to drink of the one spirit. Then secondly, Paul talks about the one spirit. 
By mentioning the one spirit, Paul is distinguishing the Holy Spirit from every other spirit that are found in this world. And that is to differentiate him from the human spirit and from all evil spirit that are found on this earth. Now to us, we know there's only one spirit and that is the person of the Holy Spirit. Then next, Paul talks about number three, one hope. What is the one hope that we all should have? What is the one hope? The one hope is talking about the second coming of Christ. It is our blessed hope, as mentioned in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It says here, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of who? Of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. So Jesus is not only our Savior, He's also our God as well. So we have talked about the unity brought by the Spirit. Now look at the unity brought by the Son. Verse 5. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Let us look at the one Lord. We know our world is polytheistic. That means they believe and worship many gods and many lords, as stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. But to us, we believe in monotheistic, which means we believe there's only one God, one Lord, and then one Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul went on to talk about the one faith. What is the one faith? The one faith here refers to the whole embodiment of our belief in God and our whole body of doctrines, which is recorded down for us right in the New Testament. This is where we base our belief in. This is the whole system of belief which we base our trust on. And this is what we will not compromise with and this is what we will not water down concerning this faith which we believe on. Then thirdly, Paul talks about the one baptism. There's only one mode of baptism that's mentioned right in the Bible. It's called water baptism by immersion, which means every true child of God should follow and practice the moment they confess Christ as their Savior and Lord, as mentioned in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. So I talk about the unity brought by the Spirit, the unity brought by the Son. Then lastly, my last point is the unity brought by the Father. Verse 6. Let's look at verse 6. It says, One God and Father of all. Then notice number one, who is above all. Number two, and through all. Then number three, in you all. Firstly, he talks about the Father's power. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, notice, who is above all. Now, if God is above all, if he is above all, this means nobody can challenge him or defeat him. There's no power in heaven, on earth, or under the earth can stop him or overcome him. He is the greatest of all. Then number two, Paul talks about the Father's purpose. Look at verse 6b. One God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all. This is talking about His purpose. Yes, this is how God worked right through history. He will make sure His purpose, His plan always stand. And nobody on earth can ever stop Him. That's what Paul meant when he said, verse 6b, one God, Father of all, who is above all and true all. So not only Paul talks about the Father's power, the Father's purpose, lastly, he talks about the Father's presence. Look at verse 6c. One God, Father of all, who is above all, true all, and in you all. Now the preposition in right here denotes being within or remaining within. Now, we all know that the Holy Spirit 
residing within our heart as believers the moment we are saved, as stated in 1 Corinthians 3.16. We also know Christ indwell within the hearts of every believers, as stated in John 15 verse 4. Now, right here, we learn that the Father also indwell within believers. Now, that thought like this, is beyond words that can express or even comprehend. That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all residing within our hearts. What more should we fear? We shouldn't fear, am I right? For the words say in 1 John 4, 4, always stands true. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear God, we thank you that you are such a mighty and awesome God, whom we trust and believe, whom we love and worship. For you are above all, and you work through all and in us all. May your power your plan and your purpose continue to be at work in us and in our churches and in our world today. In Jesus' mighty and majesty name we pray. All God's people say, Amen and Amen.